Hello, I'm Paul. I'm Adam. And I'm Ben. And welcome to the Film Busters Podcast. The film show with no filters, no prisoners taken, loads of disagreements, but one hell of a love for cinema. If you want to hear three friends ridiculing each other for an hour or so regarding their taste in films, then you have come to the right place. In each episode, one of the team picks a film for us to discuss. It could be anything from a recent cinema release to an all-time classic. So, strap in and get ready to get mad or get vindicated as we guide you through the murky world of being a film geek. If you like what you hear, you can also find us on Twitter and Instagram using at FilmBustersPod. You can also find each of our individual accounts. I'm at FilmBustersPaul. I'm at FilmBustersAdam. And I'm at FilmBustersBen. If you want to use your eyes instead of your ears, you can also visit the website at filmbusterspod.co.uk. And if busting makes you feel good, you can also support us at patreon.com forward slash filmbusters for exclusive content. Or shoot over and get some groovy merchandise at society6.com forward slash filmbusters. All right, can we just get on with this now, please? Filmbusters. I just want to bring attention to everyone that Adam last episode was saying how how unprofessional I was with our Patreon episode and that I was messing it all up and all the editing and then when I come to actually edit Adam's audio was so bad that it took me about three times as long to edit it why was this Adam? Uh, that's because uh, my laptop decided to go into overdrive and it thought it was a spaceship and it was going <laughs> like that and okay. I didn't really pick it up and it was close to my microphone. My microphone is a new sensitive microphone, and that picked it up. So there was a lot of <laughs> in the background of my audio. So Paul had to keep deleting me from the audio. Yes, and I in. did. I just wanted to bring it up. That's all. That's that's all. I had to Paul say. loves it. <laughs> but in also in other news, it is also Paul's birthday this week. So we're saying to say happy birthday. It was my birthday. It was. Yes. What was it? Two days ago. Yes. Did you have a lovely podcast birthday? Oh, I had a lovely podcast birthday, whatever the hell a podcast birthday is. It was very nice, very chilled, locked down, eating pizza, getting some presents. This is your first lockdown birthday, isn't it? Yeah, We're it not is, round yeah. to the two people's lockdown birthdays No, no, yet. haven't got the double lockdown yet. Lovely. What films did you watch? What, is Ben even here? <laughs> ben is very silent here. He's normally got something to say. I was just waiting to see how long you would uh, notice before I spoke. I know, because I was waiting for you to cut in. <laughs> I wanted you to, to just talk. I was enjoying listening. I was trying to make conversation with Paul. It was very awkward. We had good conversation. <laughs> it was good. Uh, what movie did you watch on the birthday? Yes, answer the questions. Um, I watched... What did I watch? I watched Antichrist. <laughs> you watched Antichrist on, on your birthday? birthday? Yes. Wow. And I watched Spider-Man Far From Home. Did you watch Antichrist with your family? Uh, I, yeah, I did question. not. I did not. No, I watched it on my own. How did you get that much time away from your family on your birthday? Well, why? During <laughs> during during like there's dog walking happening during the day and stuff. So I I slipped it in. It's fine. Oh, you watching while you walking the no, dog? No, not you... while I was walking Ooh. the dog. I was at home. Oh right, okay, good. Do you not want to take the dog for a walk on your birthday? Do you not want a birthday walk? The dog walking the dog is not a chore. I said to Zoe, I walk the dog. She was like, No, it's your birthday, and I was like, Okay. That was it. That was the end. <laughs> it's your birthday. You stay and look after Woody, yes, which is far exactly. much more effort. <laughs> Wait, did you watch Antichrist with Woody then? I didn't know. He was watching Dinosaurs. Woody said, put it on. He was watching Dinosaurs. Woody was the one who suggested it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what Paul's doing in the edit right now? I'm flashing forward to Paul in the edit. Mm-hmm. See these little gaps? See these slight gaps like in between us talking. This will be going to obscurity and it won't ever be put in the podcast. No, no, th- this is going in the podcast. Don't you dare <laughs> censor me. He snips, he snips it. So there's no awkward pauses. So we sound like we're very fluid. But really, what he can't do... This is how trashy which, Ben actually is, sounds. I'm not cutting any of this bit. <laughs> this is clever. What he can't do is cut out the gaps in the middle of a sentence. Well, that's, that so adds you, flair to your t- sentence, really. Yeah, it does. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to talk a lot slower today. Okay. Please don't, Ben. These podcasts go on long enough. <laughs> and you've got <laughs> enough to do. say without you making it longer. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm going to say very little in this episode. Watch me now. Go ahead. Watch me, Daddy. Watch me. Just so everyone knows, today we are talking about the Lars von Trier film from 2009 called Antichrist. 
<laughs> this is my choice. I I just oh, wanted God. to have a, a I was thinking a lovely about discussion this about it. I was talking to somebody and um, I was talking about what different types of film we've all picked. Um, and you have picked Martyrs now, a Serbian film and Antichrist. I have. And Dragged Across Concrete isn't in that bracket, but it's in that violent bracket. Yeah. Yeah, Paul has definitely picked the most violent films. Yes, he just loves a bit of violence. I'm sorry about if that. You would, if you were to put a blanket label on the films we, suge- we suggest, I would say Paul's is violence. Adam, yours is... Although not true for all of them, I, I would say yours is like big. You go for the big films. Yeah. And I don't know what you go for the obscure films. Yes, a lot go. of the films you pick, I've never heard of. The Paul, the Paul's films I've heard of, but I've heard of them for bad reasons. Uh, not all my films are this. No, not all. Not all. Well, Just general, generally. Yeah, well, I, I like to go for something a, a little bit. Obscure and a little bit risque. Old, violent and a bit extreme. Risque. I wouldn't say your calls that the Antichrist is not obscure and, um, uh, you know, the other two, Martyrs and, and, and Serbian film. They're quite renowned for their violence. I'll say it's obscure for a podcast episode. Yes. Mm. Mm. Anyway, this is not a competition about who has the best films. <laughs> we all My know Adam has the least there. interesting I- ones. That's all we know. Uh, I think Velocipasta <laughs> is still our best episode we have. I know. If, if you if you go to our ratings, Adam's winning <laughs> in terms of suggesting the films that the other two like the most. Um, I sent this to the boys yesterday. I said to them, we collectively make suggestions of uh, certain decades, right? So Paul, all of the films he has suggested have been from the 80s, the noughties, and the teens. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Everything Adam has suggested has been from the 80s and the teens. I find and everything that, I have suggested. It's so weird. I thought, like, but we're not here was a 90s film. <laughs> Carry on. Uh, it's right on the, right on the border. Mm. And uh, mine is the 90s and the noughties. So, actually, I'm the only person to have done an original decade. But I'm the one who's more diverse. In terms of decade spread, yes, but... You've gone for the obvious decades, you two. 90s is always forgotten about. Everyone does the 80s. Everyone does the 80s for movies. I thought you said this wasn't a competition. Well, you made it one. <laughs> so I'm going to be working my way. And fortunately, the next film that I'm suggesting for us, I know isn't from one of the decades that I've suggested That's before. Nice. So I'll have just as much variety. Sunshine. I'll be up for that. I'm, I might do something like that next time. I already got my film picked before this all came up, and oh, I'm not changing it. Adam's chosen A Trip to the Moon. Yes. And we're going to do a 90-minute podcast on a nine-minute film. <laughs> we'll break down We can actually talk minutes. about that one. We can yeah. actually talk about that film in the way you like to sometimes when we go for it scene by scene. Yeah. Well, maybe that'll be this episode. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's like, part by Adam part. goes, fucking hell. <laughs> oh, let's go to part one. And then we've got... Well, we go to the prologue, yeah, prologue first, prologue first Adam. And the epilogue. <laughs> <laughs> That's at the end. I wonder. I wonder if uh, Paul is uh, going to go, uh, go on. Let's segue over. I just wonder if I might know the answers already to some of the quiz questions that you're about to ask of this film. Oh, I hope so. Yes, this uh, this segue over to the quiz. If no one knows what the quiz is, I ask Adam and Ben two questions. If they get the question right, they get a point. If they get it wrong, I get the point. They are all based on Antichrist, the film we are doing today. Would you like the first question? But first, let me no, tell you the I'd scores. Like the scores first. Yes. <laughs> yes, let me tell you the scores. You are both on seven, I'm on three. Ha! Well done, Adam. And I reckon you can both get these questions today. If you do not, then you literally did not pay attention to the film. Okay. okay. Clitoris. This is literally going to be... Okay, Adam's watched that already. He didn't wait for the, the question to sit. <laughs> um, this is literally going to be fastest to the buzzer. So whoever okay, says okay. it first will get the point. Are you ready? Yes. I'm ready. Okay. If pain is a fox, grief is a deer, what is a bird? Shit. Um, What's one? Shit. Um, despair? Yes, it's despair. Well done, Ben. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> All this biblical <laughs> shit. That took a while. It took a while. Did you look it up? No, no, no. I, I was literally thinking about the names can, of the I can of see. The three I know parts. exactly what Ben did. He put his head down and he had his fingers on his forehead. Like I did. Shape. And he had his head yes. and he was thinking. He closed his eyes and he's nodding his head slowly while he was thinking of it. 
<laughs> That's true. How do you know that? Is my webcam on? <laughs> I could just hear it in the silence. That's the three beggars. The three beggars. Well done, Ben. You're on eight. Thanks. There we go. Are you ready for the next question? My turn to peel away. Yeah. Yeah. This is so easy that you literally have to be the first one to get in there. Okay. What is their child's name who died? Oh, motherfucker. You say that's easy? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I made sure I knew what it was. Nick. Yes, Adam. Well done. Oh, yes. well done. Now that you've yes. said it, I'm like, oh yes, it is. <laughs> oh my god. Wow. Do you know how I that. remember that in the weirdest possible way? Is I remember looking at the letterbox, and there's only like three up people with finger, and I remember looking at the bottom one. It just said Nick, and it's yes. spelled with a C, isn't it? Yes, it's spelled with a C. Uh, he's go. the only character with a name in the film because yeah. the other two aren't named. Yeah, aren't they? What are their names? He they're and she. They're he and she. He and Willem Dafoe yeah. and the girl from ne- Necroph- uh, What's the film? Necrophilia. Oh, That's a very different, very different film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nymphomaniac Adam. That's the one. That's their names <laughs> in the film. Look at that, Willem and Sean. Look at that. I wanted you well, to get well those done. Points. Well done. Oh. Nice and matched, eh? Yeah. I think, Paul. I don't think you are going to be quiz master. No, next I don't year, want to be. You, I want you to. We're fight not for fucking it. up too much. I want you to fight oh, for good. it. Okay, I'm fighting for it. So that was nice. Very nice. So we're ending on eight for Ben, eight for Adam, three for me. Oh, good. I mean, you could at least Excellent. put an effort in, Paul, though. Well, I, I'm, I put much effort into those easy questions for you. Well, the thing is, though, last week when you were answering the questions, you got none right. Look at look how I that was that was a very good question because you both had to really think, but you knew them. You just had yeah. to really think about. Them. I just could not remember despair. You, I could have been here about a week and I wouldn't. Uh, yeah, that. I mean, despair could have been off my radar for a while. If you had said what are the three parts called, I definitely would have gone pain, fear, and then yeah, despair would have been a tough one. I probably wouldn't have got it. Mm. It's only because it came in a moment of inspiration. Excellent. Excellente. Right, before we move on to the main event, let's just talk about our beautiful patrons. Oh, we yeah, have sure. the very wonderful Katie and Oti from the For Your Reference podcast. Yes, we do. We also have Julio from The Contrarians. We have our wonderful collaborator now, Jamie, who joined us on our last episode, Burn Off the Reading. Oh, very lovely. And we have the very beautiful Nerd Rovert. Lovely. Nerd reverts. Right, if you would like to become a patron, you can go to our Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash filmbusters. Today, after this episode, we're doing a very special episode. And the subject is our favourite films that explore what it is like to be female. Are you ready for that? And who better to tell you than three men? Yes. Exactly. Who better to tell you? <laughs> Uh, next next in our Patreon series is the best films about the black experience in America and three white <laughs> British guys are going to tell you. <laughs> it's all about fucking just looking at other people's perspectives, guys. Come on, we're doing our best here. We're trying to show a little diversity. We are. We, we can get in your minds as well. We're trying, to, we're, we're trying to be good. It's better than saying that film, our favourite films that show what it's like to be a male. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we don't want to talk about just white male stuff all, all the time. Maybe that's our lived experience. We want to talk about other diverse God, stuff. God, they're being really hard on us, our listeners, aren't they? <laughs> I know. I can hear them all chastising us. Boo, they say. How dare you. <laughs> uh, very good. Okay. So, yeah, you can join the fun with them and you get loads of good stuff from video content to T-shirts and stickers. You even suggest... The films that we cover on you the You could show. also come on the podcast like um, Jamie did, but in a nice way, like actually right. on the podcast, not come on the podcast. Oh my yes. God, you are so crass. <laughs> <laughs> I so thought of it so. and I had to say it, because uh, in my mind it had to go into your mind. You probably want to leave that out of the podcast though, won't you? Pro- no, we leave all the filth in. Ugh, yuck. I mean, mind. this is a, actually got... this is a filthy episode, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, yeah. Let's try. Let's try and not get our leave our minds in the gutter throughout the whole thing. No, of course not. Uh, and after uh, this episode, Adam will be picking the next film. And after that, we have a film suggestion from our patron Katie and Oti. They have suggested the next film after that that we'll be covering, and we'll reveal that in the next episode. Absolutely Lovely. wonderful. All right, let's uh, let's uh, do this. Yes. Feel the seat underneath you. Feel yourself sinking down into it and falling.
holding you. It's a nice feeling. All you feel is a pleasant warmth and heaviness. Imagine you're at Eden. Imagine you arrive at Eden through the woods. Gives you too much medication. Doctor Wayne says you want me back home. I heard a sound, the cry of all the things that are to die. That's what fear is. Your thoughts distort reality. You have to have the courage to stay in the situation that frightens you. Do you love me? <laughs> I can't do this. The ground is burning. The ground is not burning. Nature is Satan's church. Do you know what you're saying? You shouldn't underestimate him. Tell me what you think is supposed to happen in the woods. Where are you? I should not come here. Get out! Okay, everyone, today we are talking about the 2009 film Antichrist from Lars von Trier. This is a spoiler episode. We'll be talking spoilers from the off. There's no hanging around. So if you haven't seen it, you might want to go watch it and then come back and listen. But first, Adam, are you even ready to do this? Are you ready to do a good plot summary of the film? Are you really ready? I, I was literally just thinking about it then. We had this little break that probably isn't in the podcast, but between that section and this section. And I thought, oh shit, I need to do this bit. Um, so I'm just going to go in with it. This film starts off with a baby falling out of a window. Mayor spoilers there, straight up. The baby straight died. Up. The mum is in a bit of grief. She's like really upset. She's not processing it well. Whereas her husband, who's a therapist, is trying to help her overcome all the powerful feelings that she has. Um, and then they go on holiday. Well, they don't go on holiday. They go to the cabin. <laughs> on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> they go to the cabin in the wood where they holiday. used to go on holiday. Well, the mum and the son used to go on holiday. And she's over trying to calm it. She's got all these feelings in her. And then some weird shit happens. Very much. <laughs> yes. Name one weird thing that happens. Um, she cuts her clit off. Of course. Okay. Of course, so of course it's that. where you go to. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what, she... Oh, she puts an animal grinder through some guy's leg. All right. So just a tiny little bit of uh, context. Antichrist was actually written in 2006 when Lars von Trier was hospitalised because he had spiralled into depression and the film is supposedly very largely influenced by his own struggles with depression and anxiety. It's also the first film in his depression trilogy, the second instalment being Melancholia and the third instalment being the Nymphomaniac films. And it stars our beautiful Willem Dafoe and Charlotte Gainsbourg. And Willem Dafoe has been on the podcast before. He was in our My Son, My Son, What Have Ye Done episode. But I also feel like he was in something else. Because I remember saying, Willem Dafoe. We haven't covered Dafoe much. No. And I feel like he's the kind of actor who lends himself to very fucking interesting films. Mm. Mm. Yeah, very much so. But also some very mainstream films. But this is the former. So there we go. There we go. Yes. Let's get into it. Let's get into Come it. on, Paul, it who's is, going first? It's my choice, so I think we're going to do Adam, me, Ben. Okay. Okay. All right. I've never seen this film before. I've heard a lot about it. I've heard... I think you two have spoken about it quite a bit. Um, uh, yeah, I don't really know much about it. I've kind of... Well, from the name, you kind of think it's biblical, and then you get into the film, and you start to realise it is probably very biblical, and that what it's based on. Um, the performances from both of them, they are great. They are very well done, but the actual film itself, I found it very boring. It's nicely shot, like you can tell that he's a very. The opening to the film, the first, was it first five ten minutes? I don't know even if it's that long. 
that is wicked. Like, if that was just a short film, you probably, I'd, I'd be like, that, that was really good. But the rest of the film after then, it's just a very long, long film. Um, and it, yeah, I, I didn't like it too much. It was just good acting, but then I, after a while, that wears off because the actual plot of the film is just quite boring. Um, yeah, there's some violence in it and they show some penises and some whatever. But that all seems a bit unnecessary, and by then you're like, why are we even doing this anymore? Um, I'm gonna be, fuck, this is gonna be quite harsh, but it's a five out of ten. Wow. Well, well it's how you feel. It's gone in for the jug. It's how you there. feel. I, I can see people rating this film many different ratings anyway. Oh yes, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, depends on your take on it. Yeah. I ain't even mad at you, bro. It's <laughs> how it's how you it's how you took it. It's fine. No worries, Adam. Okay. Shall I go? So how did you take yeah. it? Okay. Um, background on Lars. I'm not the biggest fan of him. I feel I feel like he feels a little bit like a a one trick pony most of the time. His like his his big like set pieces normally revolve around like grotesque and highly realistic sex acts, which I find quite <laughs> tacky. But Antichrist interests me. It's one that I, I like. I really want to delve into with its like. G- is it genocidal? G- geno- genocidal? Gen- genocide. Genocide. Yeah. genocide. Yeah. Which I Gen- wasn't really aware of before yeah. this film. It's the like term it's, genocide. Yeah, I didn't know because I know it's genocide. It's yes. Genocide. Yeah. Genocide. It's like genocidal themes, but mm. um, and what it means to be a woman through history, and also generally what the piece is really trying to say. But I don't particularly like watching it. I don't really take like any enjoyment away from it, but I do appreciate it in a way and find it incredibly, incredibly fascinating to a point. Mm. And I look forward to getting into it, and I'll leave it there. But I give it a seven out of ten. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah, I give it a seven. Oh, I, excuse me, all over the place. Yeah. I thought this. I thought you fucking loved this film. No, 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 no. I don't love it. I just wanted to talk about it. Oh. Interesting. Okay. All yeah. right. Well, okay. So, shall I go? Yeah, go for it. So, I agree with everything that you just you just said um, and uh, can't wait to fucking discuss it. This film is made for discussion. Like, I watched this, rewatched this um, without Jenny and immediately afterwards I was like, I want to say so much. I want to start discussing this because it's not a film you can watch by yourself, I don't think, and then just let it roll around in your head. Mm. You need to fucking talk about it. Yeah, definitely. Because um, there's, there's so much that gets discussed in the film uh, throughout. But I'm, I'm going to break it down to this. I think, like... Adam showed you there you could find it very dull and very boring and not engage with it you could appreciate the performances but not engage with it equally you could think it's one of the best films that's that's ever been made you could think this is really progressive piece potentially about women and what it is to be a woman or you could think this is the most misogynistic fucking film you have ever seen I could Mm. see how people could view it both ways what I think is brilliant about this film is that the direct Lars von Trier, because he's on record for with his own depression and everything uh, about his films is like him inserting himself into his characters. People criticise his female characters, but I think he's super fucking progressive because he's actually putting himself, his mindset, into female characters mm. rather than um, having women play the traditional fucking roles that they always have in cinema. And rather than just putting his emotions into the men, he actually identifies with the women in his films and he gives them that exposure. And I think that has made for fucking fascinating discussions and and explorations of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman in these films. Now, I'm going to be totally honest. I still don't fully understand everything that's going on in this film and I can't pretend to understand exactly what he's trying to say, but my interpretation of it which which we'll we'll go through as we discuss means for me it worked perfectly the acting is wonderful i you know i love dialogue anyway so yeah. what you found boring I, f- I find quite riveting um but also the style of it how things were shot the shock of certain scenes and what they meant it all amalgamated to the best Lars von trier film that i've ever seen and it's, it's a nine out of ten for me oh uh, beautiful I, I the funny thing is i thought that you um i don't know why i thought that but i thought that you gave it a nine out of ten paul no 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 I've i thought you didn't like this film paul Actually, I no, I, think, I feel like lower. I might have had it lower than a seven. 
Really? Yeah, but I can't remember what I had because I removed it. I don't know why I thought you liked it so much. Yeah. So five, seven, nine. We got a nice split then on this. Yes. Yes. It's, I think I'm, this is the first time that I've liked a film that you've picked more than you did. Mm. I, this, I think that's the same for you, Adam, as well. I don't think I've ever liked a film more than both of you that both of you picked. Mm. This is why I really want to talk about because it is it is one that I feel it's almost like the Mulholland Drive episode where we can almost mm. try and dis- try and discover together what this film is actually trying to say. Oh, please, let's, because yeah. I was confused as hell. Yeah. I mean, so was I. This, but this is, break, this is break it down. And I was thinking the best way maybe to do this is to go chapter by chapter and just, like, yeah. briefly kind of talk through what has happened in that, that chapter yes. and what we think it means. Agreed. That's the best way to do it. Otherwise, I feel like this unruly. film is a... I'd in, get more enjoyment out of discussing this film and talking oh, about imagine. what everything means than actually watching the film. Mm, mm. I feel I, like I, that's, I where the, that's where the hidden... That's where the, the actual good part of this film is, is in all of mm. that. But when you actually go to watch it, yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah. So let's go. Okay. Before we do that, can I just get a gauge from both of you about what just in a in a couple of sentences, do you think it it was like misogynistic, or do you think, or do you I think something else? Think, think to an extent, yes. Okay. I, I did. I felt like it's because she's the only one who seems like she's done wrong, and she's the only one who's troubled by it. And yeah, it just felt wrong that everything. She was the one who was going crazy towards the end and all that type of stuff. And like she mm-hmm. wanted to kill him when he's just acted sane and normal, which is probably well, we talk about, we talk not about a great that look from either side because then it's the whole thing of men have to be strong and that kind of whole mentality still from him and her that whole mentality of that craziness. Well, good. That's what I'm glad that uh, that's I'm glad that you said that because now we know where you stand. Because as we go through it, we can like refer to this. What about you, Paul? I I see it's like an exploration of like womanhood through the ages and how like witch hunting and all that kind of stuff and it's always deemed in history that there's been these evil women who need to be purged of their evilness and it's it's almost like she's put this upon herself because she had this moment where her child died and she thinks maybe because she's done all this research on it so it's almost like she's put this on herself to think maybe maybe we are evil but i feel Mm -hmm. it's feel like it's not trying to say women are evil Willem Dafoe's trying to push that away from her, saying, "No, what are you thinking? This isn't it. the research isn't even right." Like he was saying at the end, mm. but she just kind of absorbed it and believed it all to be true. And I don't think it's necessarily trying to say that she's like women are evil. It's just exploring history of it. Yeah, that's yeah. I I agree with uh, with that largely. I think she her madness makes her fucking spiral into believing that like her research ends up being turned against her and she actually sides with the fucking side of history as opposed mm. to the learnings from it and yeah, I, it's like that I, whole, think, I mean that whole google google everything and you're gonna die yeah yeah mm. yeah but i think that um willem dafoe unintentionally is the real villain in it and i and i think there's a lot there that's that's portraying him as actually the reason for her for her decline, her descent into madness, and what happens mm. is all because of choices and things that he he did. He, he I think he's a bully, a very subliminal bully all the way through. But we talk about it. Let's go. The prologue, black prologue. and white. Your favourite part, part, Adam. Go on, let's talk about yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, it was the most interesting part of the film. It immediately has your attention. Um, what's this film? Because bad? there's a big though, cock it? sliding into. Oh, this is the thing vagina. I don't get. There is no need for that though. They, they, you just show the sex thing. You don't need to show the cock. And that's so he used away. he used actual porn stars for that. Mm. Oh, it wasn't them too. No, no, no. Like oh, there, there was a, a they agreed uh, that there was going to be no real sex. It was all doubles, even though it looks convincingly like they're having sex multiple times in this. They never do. Mm-hmm. Okay, but yeah, it's just like I mean, there's no need for actual sex there, is there? Isn't this why this film got banned? Didn't it? I think it was probably banned not for that, but m- many other things. I mean, yeah, but like I mean. I'm not you know my stance on sex I don't really care it's Lars von Trier doing it's like a precursor for everything we're going to see the, the fact that they're having sex is integral to what happens at that it's moment it's integral so to it the part you don't few... actually need to see them having sex 
Well, you do for the scene to make sense. I you know that the head actual, You don't actually the actual need to see penis. the dick. Yeah. You, no, I, mean, no I, I suppose you're right. Yeah. Mm. But then he likes to shock. This is the type of film you're in. So, yeah, you got to go with it. But Lars likes to shock. It is 100% integral to what follows in the rest of the film. You need to see the sex. In the yeah, shower. you need to know that they're having sex, but I don't see it. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Their sex is too um, unrealistic for me because they were having sex in the shower, then against the washing machine, then in the bed, then somewhere else. And it's like, I'm sorry, you're not going for that long in all those different places. So messy as you're, well. Like, they yeah. must be wetting everywhere. Knocking everything over. <laughs> everything was getting knocked With over. A big bottle of water they knocked over. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Heat of passion. I mean, it looks great when you play it in slow motion like that. But. It looks fantastic. It's beautiful. It's such a beautiful segment of the film. It I is. Love it. Re- I mean, that's why this. That's why I'm saying this film isn't a bad film. Like, you cannot possibly come out of it and say this is the worst film ever made. You might not like it, but like, it is well directed. It is well edited. All that type of stuff is mm-hmm. actually at the heart of it. Is a good film, and it's all that. But you might not just not like the film. Yeah, I'd be very surprised if anyone said film. that was film was utterly awful. Yeah. So how did we feel when the baby tumbled from the window? Oh my god! Basically, listeners, people who haven't seen the film uh, but who have decided to come along on the journey, this scene is Willem Dafoe, Charlotte Gainsbourg having sex while their toddler climbs out of his pram or, or crib and goes to the window ledge and falls out and dies. Yes. I mean, it's a oh, horrible one of the most powerful openings to a film you can see. I hate seeing his head fall back when he's on that windowsill. Yes. You know, when you see it, it's the slip, because it's snowing yeah. and it's obviously slippery on that windowsill, and you see yeah. the head fly back. And, and it's also, I love the, the um because then it, it goes with the shot of their heads falling back while they're having sex. It's very well mm. done, but it's horrific. It and you see him actually falling. Oh, yeah. it's horrible. So horrible. Yes. Disgusting. And at this point, ladies and gentlemen, we take it for what it is. We know nothing other than his mother and father were having sex and he fell out the window. That's all we know at this point. Mm-hmm. We don't know anything more than that. That's all we know. Yes, yes. And you, but, and this is our first, our first uh, time we see the pain, grief, despair on his toys. Oh, I didn't see this. Yeah, there's little, yeah, little metal statues. Yeah, that say it, one, they all say pain, grief, despair on them. Do they? Yes, indeed. But it could, it, could be, it could be something from the mother because it doesn't look like a, a toddler toy. Why the fuck would you give your child something that says pain, grief, despair? I know, despair? I know. That's what I mean. It's they're like little soldiers, and each at the bottom they have a little heading saying pain, grief, despair. Whether peculiar. they're his toys, who knows? But that's our first sighting of this. Almost the the, the three beggars. The three beggars, should we the say. The three beggars. Yeah. And then we cut to chapter one called Grief. Yeah. Grief. And immediately we see a shot from the back of a hearse Willem Dafoe right up against the windscreen, devastated, crying. Oh, he's great. She's sort of like lingering back, not showing too much emotion, then she faints. Mm. Willem is great at crying. Hospital. He's so good at he crying. He is very believable very, there. Very. very. This is where we get the first idea of how she's dealing with this whole thing. It's almost like absent of emotion. She doesn't know how to process what has happened. Uh, I disagree. Because I think at that moment, just in that snapshot moment when she's walking behind the hearse, it looks like she doesn't know how to deal with it because he is sobbing so much. Her, like, stoniness almost seems, like, wrong, bizarre. She's still processing it. I then think, considering how she is when you see her in the hospital afterwards, she is grieving. She just wasn't in that moment. She was like, as many people do at funerals, they they just shut down. Shut down, yeah. Yeah, he, she was just still processing it. She hasn't yeah, really but um, that's what I mean. She doesn't know how to process it, and she's shut yeah. down. Almost absent. Suppose, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But then she wakes up in the hospital. Yes, one and, month uh, later, it seems. Or she'd been in there for that whole month. Yeah, a whole month she's been in there. It's a long time to keep someone in. I know. For I fainting. Know. <laughs> <laughs> she might have But hit Willem's her head. pissed. Willem, who is a therapist, is like... I don't want you on this medication that they're giving you. They're amateurs. You need to experience the grief. You need to go through it. It's healthy. And she's mm-hmm. like, they're professionals. Mm-hmm. They're professionals. And he's like, no, no. I'm, I will treat yeah. you. I will coach you through this. He wants to take all the, all, all the heavy load onto himself, doesn't he? He started yes. this ball rolling. He started this ball rolling. And this is why it plays into what you said, Paul. Like, 
man is responsible. He mm -hmm. is responsible for what happens to her. If at this moment in time she was allowed to stay on those drugs and go through the process for a short while and not be thrust into his hands and mm. his treatment, nothing that came afterwards may have happened. Yeah. There's a reason that people go on medication for mental health reasons. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason that you don't not do it at all and just try and deal with it naturally. Yeah, very much Medication so. is not a bad thing. He pushes her into this hole of, of, of her own emotions and thoughts and, and research. Yes, he mm. treats her like a like a fucking thing, a, he, a piece of research, mm. like an experiment. He's not totally like cold, but he seems the minute. This is the thing that's interesting. When he was crying behind the hearse, that's the one time in this film that he really shows any emotion. The rest of the mm. time, he's very disconnected from the fact that his child has died. Immediately, mm -hmm. his obsession becomes her and, and and her as his pet project. Right, now we're going to work out why um, you're feeling the way you're feeling. I mean, we need to get to the root cause of this yeah. and that. And he stopped he treating her like a wife as well. Yeah. It's almost yeah, it was... absent... It's absent of the love. Like, maybe that scene of him walking in front of her is almost like, you should be comforting your wife right now rather than... Like, you might be grieving, yeah. but comfort yeah. her. And you should be comforting her through her grief, through this whole period, not trying to... Try, as your, like, your patient. You can't treat yes. her like a patient the whole time. Yeah, yeah, because he says to her as well, "You can't have, never have sex with your therapist," or something like that. Yeah, and at that moment, mm. then that's true. He wants the therapist relationship with her yeah. rather than the husband relationship. But then she really has to get at him for the sex, mm. clambering all over him. And yeah. is she ever in films where she's not trying to have sex with somebody? Well, you're only th talking about the films you've seen her in with Lars von Trier. It's Lars von Trier has yeah. sex in a lot of his true. shit, mm. and then she gives him a very big bite on the nipple. <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> makes him jump. Is this all still in the stage chapter one? Well? Yeah, yeah this is still chapter, chapter one. one. This, we okay. also we it might be is it before this when she's talking about blaming herself and she said she knew that he could open the gate now and he wasn't sleeping. But I mean, like, kind of we kind of see the shot at the end and understand why she probably blames herself a little bit more than than she's leading on really because mm. she saw him. <laughs> Well, yes, we get to that. Yes, we'll get to that. Yeah, th but this is where it goes. It, it pads into the. Uh, it goes into the vase. Vase. We go into the the vase, the vase. However you want to pronounce it, the dirty water. Almost like seeing, seeing the dirtiness on the inside or something. I don't think it's trying to say something like that. Maybe. The murkiness underneath that the flowers are supposedly sprung from. If the flower is the child, the mother is the dirty, murky water that it's mm. growing out of. Very good. Much like the dead baby deer that hangs out the back of its Oh, yes. Um, we're not there yet. But we're not there yet, no. <laughs> yeah. Just going back to that house. So one of the big things that Willem Dafoe is saying to her is, right, what what, uh, what scares you? What, what are you afraid of? And she's like, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. And then he's like, okay, where mm. scares you? Mm -hmm. And then she says Eden, and Eden is the name of this fucking place yeah. that she went to with Nick to work on a thesis last year or the year before or something like that. Yeah. So it holds. Very interesting that it's called Eden. Yep. Yeah, Garden and of Eden. Yes. And he is he, and she is she, almost like they are Adam and Eve. And as we know from the Bible, it was Eve who was tempted by the devil in to the garden. Apple. So Eve would be the one who is scared of Eden because it was the scene of her original sin. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Or, so the, and, you know, here comes the hypocr the, the fucking bullshit patriarchy. It's the man who's written the Bible that has said that shit, of course. The woman is to blame. It wasn't the man who took no. the apple. He had Strong to, no man, part in Weak it. woman, no. Weak woman was whispered to by the serpent to eat the apple. You're preaching yes. right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I See mean, how easy it is to be a preacher. I don't believe it for shit. You just have to say shit like that. <laughs> Go on, Adam. There's many problems with the Bible, so we probably won't get into that, will we? Misogynistic <laughs> well, problems, telling you what you can and can't do, and outdated yes. views. But what do you what do you take from the fact that here she basically says Eden is where she's most exposed. So nature. He writes in that little triangle. He puts Eden, and then he writes nature. Yeah. Not right at the top, and she says not at the top but very near the top. So what does nature mean for her? 
well in 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 my sense that out in the wild is very like there's there's not many distractions and it's almost like you can sit in your thoughts and it's obviously very re- a, a, like a relevant place for her as well so it adds that kind of extra horror to the whole place yeah mm. this is where the film lost me because i just found this stuff quite boring. very early on it lost you then <laughs> like <laughs> chapter one <laughs> yeah this it was kind of like this it's just like I don't care for all these biblical references and all of this kind of metaphor to this. I don't think it was well, too much, though, man. It was. Like, I mean, the three biblical. beggars and stuff like that, that is quite... All these animals representing things. you got the garden and all this. Like, him, I don't know, trying to play God and trying to fix I mean, it could be seen way. as heavy-handed, but I don't see it as very particularly biblical. There are elements of it, but overall, it didn't seem too heavy-handed with the religion no. I focus more on the, the treatment of women. That's what I was yes. focused more on than than actual. Bible yeah, and that's references. also another thing that's probably very biblical as well. The women, the treatment of women within the Bible and stuff like that, and throughout time in history. Yeah, well, that's yeah. just something in history. That's not really anything to do with the Bible. Well, it is because they're not treated very well in the Bible, are they? Well, as well, yes. That's where the basis of religions finds that the the way they treat women in real life, and that's why some countries base still with second-class citizens because they believe in all these religious tropes. Yeah. It all comes from religion, which was the birth of fucking civilization. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, there's a lot of it, and it just kind of, like, I just, like, was not on board with that. It just you were not on board it. very early on, son. Yeah, I know. The minute That's they started said, having conversations, you were like, I'm out. I didn't well, come no, not the conversations, but... I don't want dialogue. Like, <laughs> you're trying to get into it, but when the stuff they're talking about is interesting... It was super interesting for dialogue, man. They, like, every fucking thing that was said in this film, it was like, oh, what does that mean? Let me read into that. Mm, break it all down. So much so that I can't. Like, I can't comprehend everything mm. that it was about. Exactly. I guess. But, but Adam, do you yeah. like philosophy? I've got... Yeah, I've got time for philosophy. Yeah, well, that's kind of what it is. Like, you know, in life if you listen to philosophical conversations they they're more they may seem like oh well, there isn't maybe a point to this this it's is just different from a philosophical conversation though well maybe yeah it's a bit of philosophy a bit of psychology i i didn't see there being that many bible it's like a modern day man. modern day like they've lost life which was the human life of the world and now they're trying to deal with it themselves adam and eve well, take the Adam and Eve connection out entirely. We're still just talking about a man and a woman. Like I, I treat it much more on the basis that mm. we're we're dealing with a man. So they've had a kid, the baby's died, and the man decides, right, this is not going to be about me. This is going to be about you, and we're going to work. Gonna try and play God you are and try and fix human feeling. life by himself, and playing God and dealing with what well, he feels it. right is life. All right, well, perhaps there is. Well, we'll see. We'll move on to chapter two. Let's see what else there is in terms of biblical shit. Let's just, I just want to put, before chapter two, just want to say this is also where the point where she starts wanting to have sex distract from the pain. And she's also smashing her head on the toilet because she wants to feel pain to take away her own inner pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a bit of Very relevant, yes. Mm -hmm. Sex and violence is very entwined throughout the film. Yes, indeed, indeed. Chapter two, pain, chaos reigns. So why do we think uh, this may be jumping the gun a little bit to the very end of this chapter? Mm-hmm. The fox, infamously from this film, apart from the violence, is is the fox saying chaos reigns. So my take on why that the line is even in there and why this chapter is called chaos reigns is because it's the opposite of of his way of life. His his life is rationality, order, reason. Mm-hmm. We will address things and will work out the reason for everything but once he gets there with her the chaos of nature the chaos of her reigns supreme her off her drugs her allowed to spiral is what it emerges yeah it's very good good point yeah Yeah, i agree with that it's rebelling against everything that he believes in yes Mm. that's what it is it's it like there's a lot of stuff well it's biblical but it's also like man v woman it's also like ration r- reason versus chaos mm. there's always a push and there's a pull yes mm. it's almost like he's also trying to fix this with very rational ideas and doing his mm. whole therapy stuff where you kind of do just need to let her just go through it herself and whatever ha- whatever she's dealing with at the time you deal with it as you come across each step 
rather than trying to yeah. plan it out ahead of you and trying to work out in a very methodical way you just need to like yeah it's not like learning in classrooms actually learning on the street about something almost mm-hmm. different mm-hmm. The, also about the fox I think it's also very relevant that it's eating itself yes what do you reckon the relevance of that is I assumed maybe it was a female fox who was eating the baby inside the womb oh really I, I assumed it because we're seeing the animals with their babies throughout. So oh, I just, I just, it just came up with what I thought it was. Then I just immediately just <laughs> figured out what I think it is um, that it's consuming oneself with an idea. Maybe yes. like consuming yourself because that's all she was consuming herself with this idea that she's a this horrible, this terrible, uh, terrible thing. person. Yeah, maybe. Hmm, that's interesting though. Eating mm. the woo, eating out the baby. But see mm. now. Going, thinking of the first time you watch this film, at this point, before the fox, like once they get there, yes. you're, we're still just seeing it for what it is. Yes. We're just still seeing, okay, this terrible accident has happened and now he's brought her out to this cabin where she spent this time with Nick to try and get to the root cause of it. Yes. And then she she's terrified of the place. Yes. And she just wants to and run And do we there. know, are we meant to know why at this point? I, I I would just assume that it's, it was the place that she was with Nick, and it's where she fondest Well, she memories. clearly she clearly was spiraling when she was doing her research, and that and she was so consumed with it that she put the son's f- shoes on wrong. No, no, don't talk about that stuff yet. We we'll get to that shit. That's later. So That's are you, much so later. Uh, so are you talking about how I why I thought she was scared at of this, this place now at this, at this point, point? Yeah, yeah. As we go through the film. because I am I I just thought that maybe she spent time with her son here. That's what I was thinking. It's fond memories, that's what I thought of. Yeah, it's like a place where, where you've had yeah, a mate, an amazing time and mm. it's almost like you, you, you're you reliving a good memory and it just turned into a bad memory because that person's absent. Right. So that's why she was most afraid to go there because it was a good place that they shared. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But she also true. was more like more scared to be outside than inside. She wanted to get to the cabin. She didn't want to be yes, outside. Yes, she was legging it for the cabin. Yeah. So Lars von Trier has this massive fear of nature. This is again why I say he's putting himself in the women because oh, really? he was depressed when he's right. He has, a, like, literally, he's terrified of the outside. <laughs> so he decided to make a fucking film there. Yeah, mm. animals, mm. bugs, grass, trees, all of that nature. He's terrified of. Mm. So it could be just quite a literal fear of nature, but obviously within the film, it must represent something else to her. You can totally see that fear of nature. There's horrific stuff in this, like to do with nature, like the the animals and the bugs on the. How the fuck you be can be scared of nature? Bugs I can get, but why yeah. would you be scared of like trees, earth, grass outside? Mm, I'm not sure. That's about beautiful, that one. man. That's yeah, much better than buildings and electricity and shit. I would yeah, I would say I'd understand maybe a fear of like public, like really public places where like buildings and it's very Built like popular. Yeah. Like, populated and maybe it's the 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 fear of nature wide open spaces is how isolated and alone you can be yeah yeah i guess i guess it could go back to that point i said when being in your own thoughts there's nothing to distract you no distractions yes yeah yeah exactly hence why well we get to that yeah yeah okay we also on the way to the cabin we see the hole in the ground for the first time which is quite relevant we do later down the down the line I will tell you yes. what I think that means well the one underneath the tree yes, yes the one under the tree yeah so it gets to the night then she, she runs to the house and she falls asleep so Willem Dafoe just sleeps next to her puts his hand out the window for some reason <laughs> so I wrote a note here did he do that or are we supposed to think she did because at first they go to sleep and the window's closed right yes. when all the the acorns, acorns are raining down on the ceiling the window's closed then Cuts to him waking up, windows open, and his hand is out. I mm. think she put it there. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, that, that's a good shout. Yeah, what were they? What were the things on her? Leeches on on him? Sorry, I don't know. They were, I, 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 yeah, like t- ticks they were, or yeah, they were sucking blood. Yes, he didn't like know. it. No, they were like he was white. yanking that shit off. They were white. They were weird. yes. I hated it. <laughs> I don't like shit like that. Who Disgusting. does? <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that shit sucking on me either. No, get him off. You know, this is why Lars is terrified of nature, I suppose, then. Mm, these mm. these all these unexplained things that can 
You know what it's like when you wear a white t-shirt on a hot day, all of a sudden all these fucking things are on you. You're like, what the fuck? Get off me, man. <laughs> I can see now you say he's got a fear of nature. You can definitely see that coming through in this film. Mm. Definitely. And then, as if as if by magic, something else horrific ha- happens in nature. The little bird dies, and the, yes, it's the eagle comes see, and takes man. it away. It's like flapping, oh. It's horrible. That's, that shit is horrible to see. But again, you know, it's a baby bird, and I, I would assume it's the mother swoops down to eat it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I never thought that. I, I imagined it was a predator. But, yeah, that makes sense. I thought it, it was the, the mother. Yeah, that makes sense. I immediately sense. thought it was the mum. Like, nothing yeah. goes to waste kind of thing. I need to keep eating. Oh, very good. This is... There you go, yes. And this is the point where I started thinking, okay, this is the theme of the film. It's nature. The order of the world is chaos and it rains. Nature is the fucking unexplainable. Mm-hmm. It's terrible shit happening, which can't be explained away. Or... Um, can't be rationalised. Like, why do fucking awful things happen for no reason? Mm. It's the chaos of things. And yeah. nature and the animal kingdom and the way that sort of ruthless brutality go hand in hand. Nothing we can do about it but go with it. Willem Dafoe tries to fucking think through it and rationalise it, but she was trying to just feel her way through it, just go go with it through mm. the medication. Mm. The natural order. You can't control the uncontrollable. Nature is a beast. And then he's real patronising here because he's like, oh, we're going to do a little exercise. I'm going to put these stones here and you're going to walk from here to here. And it's like, you could see how he could be seen as quite this nice guy, helpful guy. But actually, that I'm looking at that and I'm like, you're a fucking manipulator, man. Yeah. You've brought this woman into this situation, your wife, who you're supposed to love. And you're treating her like this fucking experiment yeah. in a patronising Ugh, unobvious subtle way yeah. it's not it's not even getting to the root of the problem either it's she's clearly scared what is walking from one thing to another that she's completely terrified of gonna do it's yes. just gonna make it even more scared yeah exactly it's make it it's overcome getting... her fears wouldn't it yeah. yeah well overcome her fears but I think you got a good a good psychologist should get to the root of the problem first and because the problem is not actually anything to do with the physical thing they're scared of it's normally something totally different mm yeah a exactly brute. and what you just said you hit the nail on the head a good therapist I think it's quite significant that he clearly isn't because when they're talking in the hospital earlier in the film she says you know you haven't even got your doctorate and he's like oh I don't need that I don't need that it's almost like he's mm-hmm. going his own way with it he, yeah. he isn't fully qualified yeah this is this is his, his research his project to get him to yes yeah get him get his credentials Yes, mm. we get. We also do. We we get a flashback here, don't we? When she when she used to heard a, she heard a noise when she was looking after Nick. Yeah, that was weird. I didn't fully get the story. Mm. You you keep hearing Nick crying, and then she's running trying to find him. But then he was fine in the room, and she, and it was apparently the forest that was making the noise. She said. Yeah, because she ran around the woods, didn't she, for a while, and she yeah. was outside, and then he's actually just back in the room. Yeah, yeah. So then, knowing what we know now like read into that that she was getting lost literally lost out in the fucking weeds of of everything that she was researching she was getting further and further away from what she was actually meant to be looking after mm. and for mm. herself nick the thing for her thesis slipping yeah. into that madness it's going into like the the satanic kind of way of her research where as if these women are actually satanists and there is this mm. evil out in the world, out in the outside yeah. world, hidden away from the human eye, in the in the na- in nature, and yeah. she's almost like putting it outside, just outside the cabin, yes. and it's just out there, and she can hear it. We'll come back to that once we get to chapter three, mm. and we learn a little more about her. And this is li- literally she's in this in this chapter. She also says nature is Satan's church, and that is her fear. And he writes down Satan. Is Satan the fear, but he said he disregards it. He thinks that's a stu- that's a stupid reason. Yes, he puts Satan at the top. Yeah, of that triangle. Yeah, and then crossed it out. But again, okay. So going back to Eden, I know Adam will love this bit. We're going to go biblical again. <laughs> but if if this nature is Eden, Satan was there 
in in Eden, yeah. and Eve would be scared to go back to Eden because who did she meet there? Satan. Satan made her do a bad thing, and to follow the biblical line again, the Bible teaches everyone that beyond the Garden of Eden, by Eve doing that, she allowed Satan into man, into people. Mm-hmm. So Satan no longer lives in Eden, it lives inside. Mm-hmm. So whatever she discovered when she went there with Nick beforehand, whatever bad thing she discovered or experienced, lives within her. Yep, she took away from it. Yes. Mm. Because he then later, I can't remember if it happens now, but he then later scratches out whatever he has at the top again and puts me as yeah. in her. But in quotation mm. marks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Scared of us. Her me. Yeah. Hermes, the shit delivery company. Futurama. I was talking about the shit delivery company. In Futurama, <laughs> there's a guy called Hermes who runs a spaceship delivery company as well. Oh, really? Oh, there is, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> Clever That's gag. for your reference, for your reference. Yep. Yes. There we go. And then, does he read a letter now? Oh, Which is we it don't now? know what it says. Well, that's the thing. Like uh, When I saw it, I suddenly thought, hang on, didn't we see this letter earlier on in yes. the film? Have I missed what I he read? I thought he found it, and or did she find it in the, at, at the start? No, she finds it later, oh, but okay. we see him here in the cabin reading the letter, but we don't see what it is. And then after he reads the letter, he suddenly has the dream of him being outside and all these falling acorns yes. are pouring down all around him and on top of him. Another very beautiful slow motion shot. Very beautiful. This is what I mean. It's still well directed and well shot and the cinematography and all that type of stuff is still good. Well, what do you think that scene represents, dear Adam? I just reminded me of the frogs falling. in um, Magnolia and the fish in Vargo, which are all, again, based on another That's story from the Bible. Idea. Yeah. Which is it when could, the... Could, yeah, it could almost, yeah. The plagues. The rains of something or other. It's when something starts raining... It's God and it's God showing His anger, isn't it, or something like that? It's what they they used to show, isn't it? That's and that take. goes hand in hand with it being Satan's God, and then and instead of yeah. God showering shit down, it's Satan showering shit down. Yeah. Mm. Do, is this good. the same scene that he sees um, the fox in? Not yet. No, no. Not because yet. then he wakes up from that dream, and she she's all fine. She's fine. Yeah. Yeah. She's in, almost in denial of what what's going on. She's acting yeah. like nothing's yes. wrong. Yes. Yeah. And the interesting thing is it's almost like a role reversal now because now he's a bit uncomfortable. Like, she was the experiment, but now it's almost like he's, after that dream and after he read the letter again, it's almost like now he's on the back foot and he's Mm, afraid of Mm -hmm. this place. Mm -hmm. It's like, what happened here? Yes. What happened to make her put the shoes on wrong? (laughs) And stuff like that. Yeah. Even though we don't know she put the shoes on wrong. We don't know yet, no. I that can't makes wait sense. to talk about that bit. You're very excited to talk about the shoes. <laughs> put the shoes on. <laughs> I'd have said the same thing. I'd have said, she put the shoes on wrong. <laughs> well, anyway, one last thing then happens in this fucking chapter, and it is the old foxy. Yes. Very scared. He, he literally just snaps at, snaps at Willem. I forgot that the, the fox snaps first, because yeah. it's another fox, isn't it? There's two foxes. Yes, yes. What did you think when you saw this for the first time, Adam? I was like... The fuck now it was kind of almost <laughs> like the baby scene happened and then it kind of just it was kind of normal wasn't it it wasn't yeah. there was just like you're trying to work out what's going on and nothing bizarre had happened yet or it was like nothing yeah nothing you wouldn't see in a, and you see a fox eating itself and talking to you and you're like okay this is what Wes Anderson left out of Fantastic Mr. Fox <laughs> <laughs> X-rated cut yeah yeah we actually didn't even address the fact that he sees the the dead baby hanging out of the deer at the end of the last chapter. Cause it, cause the, was that at the end of the, the last chapter? I thought that was the next, the last one. No, this is the end of that. chapter weird one. Shit. Yeah, and it's um, it if almost it helps, like, I think that was CGI. Yeah, it bookend, it kind of bookends each chapter. Would you be surprised though if he did actually have that happen? No, no, I wouldn't. He and found I'm, a deer giving birth and scared it and made it run away and filmed it. I feel bad enough about the baby birds because that's clearly real. That's yeah. not a robot. Yeah. We all know that about the cutting the legs off of the duck and but he was we could still we could still see the duck struggling in, in the house that Jack built. <laughs> I do not oh, remember. Shit, that I can't all. even remember that man. Yeah, he cuts a leg well, we, we, we assumed he actually didn't do it in the house that Jack built. 
I, do not, it was I, I don't remember a lot about the house that Jack built. I remember watching it with you. He was, it was when he was a little boy and he got a, a little duckling and then he was pretending to... Well, he wasn't pretending. Oh, he yeah. was cutting he was the like duck clipping legs his lungs. Off. His legs. His legs. His lungs. Jesus. <laughs> that would be dark as fuck. <laughs> I mean, the legs is just as just as bad, but you know, the oh, lungs. Worse on the lungs. Imagine yeah. going in and snipping the lungs oh, out. Oh, no, no, take, no. Take my breath away. <laughs> well, just as a side note here, because I had to Google it, an article comes up that says Peter defends Lars von Trier's The House That Jack Built against backlash over graphic animal mutilation scene. Peter defended Lars von Trier. Who? Who's Peter? Yeah. Peter. It's animal organization. Oh, yeah, right. Actually, I thought you meant some guy called Peter. No. It says here, Peter confirms Von Trier used a fake silicone leg for the duck and that no animal was harmed during the making of. Good. I'm much more concerned about whether they hurt animals than if they hurt people. Yes. Oh, yes, indeed. Totally. The people, I'm sure, are in on it, so... Yeah. <laughs> and, like, the truth is, like, at the end of every film, they've got that fucking line, no animals were harmed in the making of this movie. I'm sure you can't legally put it there if that's not true. I guess you could just not put it there in the credits and that mm. would be an admission that they were. Very true. Did it say that at the end of this? I don't know. We'll have to check it out afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I've never actually researched about the animals in this film, but mm. but I, yeah, I'd imagine half it is CGI. It doesn't even look CGI anyway. Especially the baby, the deer coming out. The deer coming out definitely looks like a bit of CGI, yeah. I mean, they'd probably just put a bit of meat on the fox and made him eat it. Yes. Yeah. Stuck it to his side. How do they get it to speak, though? They put peanut butter. Peanut butter around his <laughs> we gums. Know, we know about the peanut butter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Adam, did you not get that reference? It's from something, isn't it? They make animals look like they're talking. Yeah, if you do it around a horse's mouth, I think that's how they used to do it in television shows back in the 50s or 60s. There was some show, I can't remember what it is, about a police horse and in order to get it to talk they rubbed peanut butter on its gums so it would lift its lips and lick and stuff imagine how much peanut butter they gave that fucking horse oh yeah if that show was on for seasons man oh my god so much peanut butter that's, why, that's what Bojack's based on yep that's why he went he had all the problems he had he had too much peanut butter yes <laughs> and he's friends with Mr. All peanut right. Butter as well yes there we go there we go you got it <laughs> he had enough of that <laughs> Let's get on to chapter three, please. <laughs> chapter Got three, it. despair. And in, genocide. In, in brackets, genocide, yes. It, does it start when he goes into the roof? He goes into the roof and he finds all the, all the research he's been doing? Yeah, he finds the research and some it, of the pictures and whatnot. Yes, this is where he finds the almost like where her headspace is at the moment. And What's we the find scene the where three they, beggars. They're having sex against the tree. And then like you can see all the other humans underneath That's the tree. Coming. That's coming. That's coming. That's coming. Yeah, they, we see the three beggars in the in the astrology poster for the first time. We see the fox, the bird, and the deer. Mm. They are the three beggars, and we've we've already seen at this point. Well, we've already seen a bird, and I assumed at this point that we'd already seen the bird, but the bird comes a little bit later. Are they the three beggars, the three shepherds from the Bible? I'm not sure because they're the ones that I'm go to sure. see Jesus, and they don't have any money to offer him. They offer him like their like. The three wise men. No, no, they, the wise men, they're opposite. Though. So they're, the wise men bring gifts, and the shepherds don't have any money, so they offer him like their loyalty and all that kind of why, stuff. Why are the shepherds bringing money to a baby? It wouldn't surprise me if in the, no. the Satanic Bible there is like the, the polar opposite of the three wise men. I think men, it's in the, the normal Bible as well. Oh, is it? It's literally a polar I mean, I really opposite don't of, know the, Bible of well, the people who bring you gifts. It's the people who are asking for gifts. Mm. Yeah. And she's clearly been driven mad by this reading into all this stuff into this research yeah she, all her writing's gone really weird it goes from like writing normally to mm. all spaced out scrawled on other pages and shit like that basically we know that she at some point lost her mind there clearly yeah yeah 100 percent. and this is where he he wants to go chat to her and he calls himself nature and what does nature do he wants to harm you Yes, he's trying a different a different stance on his psychology now, but this almost seems to like bait her into <laughs> scaring her even more. Surely, yeah, I know, I know. But is this where, and this is where he's lecturing her as well, right? Because he starts with that, and they're doing the back and forth, and he hasn't even challenged her on the fact that he's found that stuff in the attic yet. No, no, he doesn't want to mention it because clearly that is the the root cause, but. I mean, a good a good therapist would probably talk about that and kind of break that down for her. But instead, he wants to disregard it and kind of break it down in his own way and 
and put himself as the fearful object. And then he, but he doesn't stick with that for long because they do this bullshit back and forth. Mm. And then she says something I can't remember what it is that kind of upsets him, angers him a little bit. And that's when he's like, "You, I've, I've found your thesis. You were supposed to be critical of these texts, but you embraced it." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, you, the, he says something like, "You saw the evidence of evil things against women, but you saw it as the evidence of the evil of women." And then, and this is even still. And it's very uh, pertinent to modern day. He lectures her on women by saying, Mm. this is what it means to be a woman. This is what was actually going on. It's a man telling a woman about her own, the history of her gender. It just so happens he's correct in what he's saying here, but it goes in line with, oh, the the typical man is going to be the one to say, no, this is what it means to be a woman. This is Mm. what really happened. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think it almost kind of spurs her whole mindset on again because he's saying, like, humankind, mankind, is what hurts women. And immediately after this scene, she wants to have sex with him and she wants him to hit her and hurt her. And he don't want to do it. No, and it's like, you're making this happen. Yes. You're spurring this on. Yeah. You've created the environment for her to feel this way. Yeah, yeah. And it goes right back to the abu- men abusing the woman because she's evil. Yeah, exactly. And that is the root cause of this whole thing. This is the research she's been doing. And yeah. she thinks she's the evil one. So, of course, if you're saying, I'm going to hurt you, yes, that's what she wants. That's what she's been doing this whole time. That's why she's she's been hitting her head against the toilet. She mm-hmm. wants to hurt herself because she feels like she needs to be punished. Well, so in that, so connecting to that, we are about to find, well... She finds the autopsy report. And this is the first time we as the audience... Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, for, no, 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 no. This, before this about happens, it. before this happens, a very important scene that Adam wants to talk about comes in. This is oh. where he tries to... He says she don't want to hit, and she r- hit her. She runs away, goes and starts fingering herself against a tree. True. How could I forget? Yes. And then they have then, sex, but then the, the tree turns into people, doesn't it? Yes. You can see, see I, it's people's arms buried underneath. Yeah. yeah. But I think this comes more um, prevalent later on and makes it more uh, makes more sense because you see all the the women in the forest, dead women, and it's just like the women through history who have been killed for being evil. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, for not even being evil, for being women. Yeah. And also, women, I yeah. I think this is this is this tree or this hole beneath this tree is very important because I feel like it represents being a woman. Like it's the, it is like a big vagina. Mm. It's yeah, a hole, hole in the ground. Yeah. yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, and and well, we'll talk about it later when, when it gets to it. So now let's talk to the bit, let's talk about the bit that Paul's been itching to talk about because he's brought it up in every other chapter. <laughs> this is the point where she finds that the letter has been hidden from her, which is the autopsy report on Nick where there was a slight deformity of the bones in his feet found, and Willem has found pictures of Nick with his, what appears to be Timberland boots, mm-hmm. on the wrong feet. And she's like, oh, I must have just done it on an unconscious level once. And then it's like, no, you've done this all the time. Several times. And that, I had forgotten that from all my previous watches. And when I watched that, that was the thing that shocked me the most in this film this time around, because that is... Horrible, mm, mm. horrible. You can see his to face repeatedly do that to well. a child. I know, man. He's and to pain. think that nobody would f- even think that's what's going on. Yeah, it's mm. subliminal, horrible torture of this little boy. And this is the point, right, where I thought maybe this film is about her just being evil. Maybe she is a, a witch. Mm. But I think this is also you've got to take into into um, play that the fact that she is gone into her research and thinking she is evil because she we, we got we got to admit that she obviously thought this before he even died because what we come to realize later on yeah that it's very obvious that she let it happen but she, she's been feeling this way for a long time and she obviously clearly thinks she's evil and I don't think that means that last one true is trying to say that women are evil it's just that no. she's been trapped inside her research and she's in that headspace 
Yes, I, I agreed. So do you then think that she never did anything to Nick? She didn't put those shoes on his feet until oh, no, she went she there did. and did the research. No, no, but did, until she did the research. Oh, yes, yes. That's why, I, yes, I do think that. So yeah. you think it was the research at Eden yes. that turned her? Yes. Okay. Because I think the her her notes show that she was obviously of sane mind. You're right, you're right, yeah. Before she started her research, and by the end she was not. Yes. And that's the, the shoes and the feet that I wanted to talk about. <laughs> so the other thing that is shit about he is that, okay, so we're getting a reinforcement here about how much of a shit dad he is. He didn't go to Eden. He was very distant as well, even though she said she needed her space. He was very uninvolved, and he was very unattentive if he mm-hmm. never realised that the shoes were on the wrong feet of his own child. It also suggests he never put his his uh, son's shoes on, so he mm-hmm. wasn't really that much of a caring father. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I much mean, how long was she woman. putting his shoes on for to make his feet deform like that it must have been a very long time exactly how i mean that's it's a horrible fucking thing man if you read that in the newspaper that someone had did that you would think what a cunt yeah wouldn't you you would say hang them yeah i mean you know we know all the stories about bounding people's feet and stuff to make them smaller it's very horrible disgusting ballerinas yeah ballerinas very very horrible and then on the back of that is when he puts me in commas at the top of the triangle Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She's scared That's of her, her greatest yeah. fear. Me, as in me, a woman. Yes. Yeah. She's scared of what she can do as a woman. Yes. Mm-hmm. There we go. Are we? Um, is this the? Are we going to shed? Shed some blood. Yes. Let's shed some blood. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It did, how did this happen? He he was just in the shed, wasn't he? He was just looking round. He was and looking then round. For she something. runs in. She runs him, gets his little willy out. And that was real Will and Willie, surely, because yes. you could see him. It was flaccid, yes, as you would expect, because he wasn't expecting any big surprises. Yes, a flaccid Willie. All the pubes were there, no trimming, <laughs> and um, and she push. He pushes her off, and then she whacks him over the head with something that shouldn't really have knocked him out quite in the way that it did. I don't think. What did she hit him with? Okay, and it like knocked him out cold. And no, no, sorry, no, she didn't no, no, even no. knock she, him in the head. She knocked she him on the him dick the, with it. Yes, she, I'm sorry, but if you got hit in the nuts with a big piece of wood, you pass you'll be out. passing out. Just for like, okay, I, I could believe because the, be like, the pain is here. insane. But then the, the, <laughs> the most unrealistic thing. Okay, so then she jerks him off. Yeah. And th- let me just let me, blood. let me just say beforehand that when she runs into the shed, she is shouting, "You are going to leave me." That's that's true. I think that's very a very prevalent line that that kind of leads on to the what's going to happen next. Yeah, remind me to come back to that. Yes, I've got a note about that and her relationship to Nick as well. But why is it? Hang on, why was his dick hard? The first he they having sex. Yeah, they were ha- they were they were having sex and then she's halfway through. You just decided something happened. That made her go away and then smack him in the dick with it. No, she just changed her thought. She just shouted saying, you're going to leave me, in it. That was before, because it was violent, and then it turned to sex. And then I there was she... something in between that made him made her smash him in the nuts. Yeah, I think he said, so. I think he said stop. I think it was that. I think it was like, stop, that this is too much or whatever. And then she smacked him in the dick. But I mean, he was ready to go. And he was ready to go, <laughs> and then I got to say, watching watching him ejaculate blood like that again after having not seen it for such a long time, I was struck by the fact that the blood just didn't look as real as uh, it did in my memory. It oh, looked, really? Yeah, oh, I thought it was very disgusting. <laughs> it's disgusting. I mean, it's I wasn't focusing effective. on if the blood was real or not at any time when that was happening. And I'm not sure on the science behind that. No, if you got smacked in a dick, would you? come thick blood I'm it, not sure it would need to go into your testicles surely the blood Adam is hating this film I can tell I can tell that Adam is hating talking about this film because I can hear him yawning and stretching and just he's so ready for it to be over I got a good fact for Adam it make him it make him happy just to lighten his mood a bit go for it then you ready for this okay this is this is straight from from the IMDB facts ready 
Willem Dafoe's penis had to be edited out of scenes because it was too large and odd looking. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> it was in the trivia. <laughs> I'm not sure that's true. <laughs> okay. Like I said, Willem Dafoe said that he never got nude for it. I mean, he did get nude. We saw his willy. Yes, flaccid. <laughs> but I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe he did get excited. Who knows? And maybe it was very big and odd looking. <laughs> well, who's to say what's odd? We come in all <laughs> exactly. shapes, sizes and proportions. Exactly. Very sorry, Willem. Here's the most we unrealistic love you, thing, though. She then drills through his leg. I'm sorry, you would wake up. You would wake up. You would wake up. It'd be like a smelling soul. Yeah, big time. She drilled yeah. through, hit the fucking calf muscle. He should have woken up. Oh. But I don't know. If you're yeah, really you knocked, out, if you're knocked out, no, if you're unconscious, anything that's happened. like smelling salts. Like it, yeah, that shit's bring you the back. Pain round. of that. Come it's on. a high. It's an. It's a sudden bam into one of your senses, isn't it? It's an assault on the senses. Yeah, but your then, body should instantly resist that. But then he's wake. all. He's already feeling the pain of his of his nuts. I know. I, it would have made more sense if he'd been properly conked in the head. So then you could believe that he was like stone cold out. Mm. I mean, we've never been hitting the nuts. He just no, passed really. out through the pain of getting his dick beaten up. <laughs> beaten up. <laughs> well, either way, he then she then attaches a lathe to his leg, mm. a lathe almost like a fucking grindstone. It's like a grindstone, isn't it? And yeah. secures that shit to his leg. Mm. This is this is also. Um, odd as well because she she secures it then throws the wrench under the house but then yeah. afterwards says that she doesn't know where the wrench is mm. it's almost like she was in a different like she was, she was being also, controlled she's thrown it possessed she's thrown it underneath the house she don't know where that's gone underneath the house <laughs> yeah but no but the fact that she I mean this is in I think this might be in chapter 4 now anyway should we come We're back about to, to this? go into chapter four. This well, is but, the last thing, I think, isn't it? Well, no. Before this happens, Willem crawls, him, crawls into the hole underneath the tree. Oh, and he finds the bird. And he yeah, and he bird, finds the bird, and he has to beat the bird up. Yes. And the bird. And he takes a long time to kill it, man. The bird, yeah. which re represents despair. Yeah. Why the hell didn't he kill that bird so quickly? It was making oh, so much no. noise, drawing her attention. Just kill it, grab it round the neck. He didn't want to. It. I think he was trying to like do it. He never really thought about it, did he? Like you could snap its neck or something, but he was just trying to. It was like almost somebody who hasn't done this before didn't know what to do. Yes, I suppose. Mm. But as I was saying about this, um, this hole that representing womanhood, it's almost like he's forcing himself into this hole and like trying to force himself upon womanhood. He's putting yeah, himself into the into the the role of knowing everything, but he's and just trying to intruder. hide in there, yeah, hide he, yeah. within the woman, yeah. so that they don't look at him and blame him. But really, he's just an intruder, and the bird is telling him that. Yes, yeah. get out. That's true. Yeah, get out. Mm. And then and then she just <laughs> basically buries him. <laughs> <laughs> she buries him and then it looks like he's dead I know he would and I been. thought oh shit I can't remember uh, she smashes him, him through the thing with the spade in it you know, through the top yeah you see his arm come out so he's still alive but then mm. but then she obviously just carries on and he it all falls in on him or something yeah and then she's so sorry for it yeah we go on to chapter 4 now which is called The Three Beggars yes yes and we see we get him out and this way she said I can't find the wrench and she runs back to the toolbox to try and look for the wrench and then comes back and says, I don't know where it is. It's like, you're the one who threw it under there. <laughs> he got very lucky with that shot through the floorboard. Oh, what? We're getting the bird, getting the bird out? No, when he, no, when he puts his elbow through the floorboards to find the wrench, he finds oh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, that I, I saw that as him trying to get the bird out because the bird was squawking underneath the floorboards. This, this is where he's saying... Yeah. Um, does it want to kill me? And she's saying, not yet. The three beggars aren't here. When they arrive, someone must die. Yeah, now what does she mean by that shit? And what, what are the three beggars to her? Are they the animals? Because if they are, as the animals do turn up to the cabin, that suggests some sort of supernatural fucking connection to the place. Mm, mm. It's, it, is almost, it is almost all completely going against the story of Jesus' birth and the three men arriving and there's a, a baby's been born but someone's going to die 
That's why yeah. it's Antichrist, not the Christ. Yeah, exactly. That's very. Thank you. There we go. I was wondering why the film is called yeah, Antichrist. We, we've just discovered what this all this film means. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is it, right? We came yeah. together with our ideas and has made sense of it. There we go. Yes. When the three beggars arrive, someone must die, as opposed to when the three kings arrive, the saviour is born. Someone must born. Mm. Excellent. There we go. And she is the Antichrist then, because she's the one who dies. So which, after she says that, I believe this is yes. where we find out that she actually watched as Nick fell from the window. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Indeed. And this... this like obviously we're talking it through here now so we're coming up with a lot of things but I'd forgotten this as well and when I saw that I was like well there's no fucking defending that no no she this, she saw him fucking yeah, die she, she, she's evil she was already in the that mindset she'd already been to the cabin she'd already been through the whole research and lost herself in the research so she, she'd she been gone by that point she'd yeah. already lost it yeah so of course she just let the baby die See, the interesting thing is we're watching a film where this stuff happens, so you build up the backstory, you get into her mindset a little bit, and then you can say she did terrible things, but she wasn't a terrible person. She was a victim of everything that she researched and whatnot. Yeah. Her mind wasn't right. Now, if you found out someone you knew, someone in your street or something, had, ki had essentially killed their child... And the, and the newspaper or whatever said, oh yeah, last year, two years ago, she was writing a thesis on witches and she just got immersed in it. You would you would say fuck her, don't give a shit, she's evil. Mm. You, we would say that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then maybe we shouldn't. You don't know the situation of the person, do you? It shouldn't take a film to tell us to look beyond. Yeah, what but you we see know. that on a personal event, not just as in a what do you call it? Uh, there's more to the event. You see the person and then the event rather than just the event. Yes, of course, yeah. But, I mean, she did let, her, let her, the child die, though. Yeah, exactly. You can't, let, you can't forget that. No, and I think th this is the thing. Like, wh while I think um, what men did to women throughout history and her reading of that ultimately affected her mindset to the point where she assumed she was evil and it, it, in the grand scheme of things the evil that men did throughout history bears down on her present day which is why she is the way she is even though all those men throughout history have caused this moment mm -hmm. she mm -hmm. is evil for having done this she is not a yeah. good person she is a victim of the past but it has made her a monster yeah 100%. And, but the, the fact of the matter is that all these women in the past were actually not actually evil. It's actually yes. people putting this evil on them. But sh that's what William Defoe was trying to say, that you know this, all this isn't real. It's like yeah. it's fake. You're, you're, all the witches it, and stuff. Yeah, it's a load of rubbish. Yes. But she's made herself evil. She has, yeah. Because of what men have been saying and doing to women throughout the centuries. Mm-hmm. There we go. And what better way to punish yourself for being a woman than to snip off your clitoris with scissors. Indeed. Yes. And leave them attached to you after you've snipped. Oh, Jesus. That's the most... Yeah, that was just... Oh. That was... That made my penis recline into me. <laughs> it was horrible. Absolutely horrible. It's, oh, almost, the, it's almost the ultimate thing... It's almost the ultimate thing as well of going against pleasure, of literally having sex yes. and then removing the thing that gives you pleasure. Yes. Not deserving of pleasure anymore. Yeah. Cause, cause it's, and it also mirrors her being um, seeing Nick and having sex at that moment. It's almost like this is what you deserve for having sex yes. at that moment. Yeah. yeah. And Very. then he strangles her to death. Yeah. And he burns Strangled. her to death. He does. I forgot he burned her. He Strangles does. her and burns her. Yeah. And it doesn't feel like a victory when it happens. That's what yeah. I found. That's what's interesting. It feels so sad, it, isn't it? It's like, oh, that's yes. just what it's come to. It doesn't feel like a fucking victory, which is why this can't be a misogynistic that's film. That's what I was about to say. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, I was about to say exactly that. And but you see and you see all the women appear around and it's like, this is another woman who's been lost too. But see, okay, before that, this is where 
there's a flip side to that because yeah you it feels like that's not a victory then it says epilogue then the beautiful music is back he's walking through the unspoiled wilderness he's eating berries it's almost like oh yeah. wow things are pure again mm, that's this true. is clean yep. and then i was th- thinking oh shit is this the misogynistic reading like the world is better without women in it but then that fucking yeah he final sees it, shot he also sees because that what all the people are walking up the hill he sees a cocoon the inside women. the bushes as well which is like new life and like this is new life being born and all these women running see isn't that not like they're now she's now the antichrist and that's the followers of satan and they're all witches now going to their new king or queen sorry Interesting that you see it that way. No, mm. I don't think so. No. I think the, see, I the, thought the, it was now she's completed her journey of being that. That is the end of her arc of what she wanted along her way of doing all these theories, and now she has died. You only get your followers after death. For like Jesus, for example, only had thirteen disciples, and then he dies, and now he gets millions of people. Well, that is interesting. I hadn't thought that of that. That's interesting, yeah. But my view on it was like these are all the, like Paul said, all the innocent women who have died throughout the centuries and their eternal uphill climb. The struggle is mm. and always has been theirs. It's not It's not Willem the Foes. That's why he's surrounded by them because it's not about yeah. you. It's about all these people that have come before. I, I, see, I, saw, I didn't see that. I just see them as like disciples or something going towards her. They're all going towards That's the cabin, I, aren't they? That's what I kind of got from that i didn't think of well that's a very interesting way of putting it and like if you if you subscribe to that reading then you've got to think that he is uh it's a misogynistic film mm. that is obviously the seesaw of what it, the the meaning behind this film what you believe in that moment do you think anyone's ever asked him outright i haven't checked it and and be like look are you mis- is this misogynistic or not and he if he's gone no it's not misogynistic the reality is i don't think it is because he was depressed when he wrote it. She clearly is the embodiment of his depression. Mm. And he got her, a well-respected actress, to consistently come back for his film. She's not a self-hating person. Mm. No, she no, no, clearly no. sees value in it. And Willem Dafoe isn't going to be like, let me go be in this misogynistic film. I agree. Yeah. Mm. If you watch a, um interview that he did with Mark Commode, um, Willem Dafoe, w- um, Mark Commode says to him, it had, this is a film with misogynistic f- themes and Willem Dafoe says no it isn't you're wrong and then Mark Camo says no I'm not saying the film is misogynistic I'm saying it deals with themes of misogyny and Willem Dafoe says no it, it doesn't it's not dealing with mis- uh, misogyny at all it's all about Lars's headspace and depression and whatnot. and that's what I think is kind of beautiful about this film it looks like he's fucking damning women but he's actually just putting his own feelings about himself and the world and he's channeling it into a female character who's abused rather than mm. a male character at the mm. end of the day the only person who could say that they if, 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 if a female watched this film and they said I didn't like that film that felt misogynistic then you can't you couldn't argue with it well I don't well <sighs> it's that I'm whole sure. it's that, that's the thing that's what it comes down to at the end of the day is if the person who's in question feels like they are then Dad, then you but then what if okay them. what if one woman says that it, it's a misogynistic film and the other person says no it's not at all they yeah, can't I'm both saying be that right the film, that makes the film you're gonna slap it with a big sticker and put it in that pile but if someone takes that away from the film you cannot argue the fact that they took that away from that film no i wouldn't argue that, that they that took it away enough. from it i'm not saying that's their reading of it it's just not that is what the reading of it is it's not like that is the no, the no, fact no, of the matter is this is a misogynistic like, film yeah it was like saying um was it nymphomaniac is just like she that's all he views women as is just a sex object and that's all they're there for but like it's not i mean it's so i can't remember all of of nymphomaniac but it like it has a catharsis at the end yeah Mm. so you've got an overarching story of this woman trying to overcome it and dogville as well you know this is a woman who was used and abused and she gets her revenge at the end like these aren't like all of them i don't think none of them are portrayed as evil characters set in a warehouse it's, it's almost yeah, like I this is... I remember what happened. I think it's more the fact that this is how Lars von Trier sees the world, but he gives the female character kind of like a comeuppance or a view of how he wants it to be in the end. And I think that is the women running uphill and he sees them all. It's like they're in paradise at the end. Yeah. Because you see that... After you see all these horrible animals, all the disfigured animals, that's when after in this prologue or epilogue, you see 
the the cocoon in the in the bushes which represents new life and it's it's the complete opposite of every other thing we've seen but all the all the animals in this film all these horrible animals you just called them are all female animals yeah, i mean it's 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 specifically done that way though to like um symbolize you know perverted mother i'm not saying this film is i'm just saying if, if that's what someone's taken away from this film you cannot argue with that yeah, cool. Because if if someone yeah. that's what that's what I can I can completely understand any any take on this film. It's your own viewing and your own interpretation mm-hmm. of it on most things. Yeah. And it's exactly the same with any other film you watch. You people interpret th- interpret things differently. It's just yes. always the way. Yeah. That's the beauty of film. If someone said they found if a, if if a woman said that they found this misogynistic, I could say I could totally see how you could take it that way. Mm-hmm. I would say I don't personally think that was the director's intent. That's but who it. are we as males? <laughs> who are me as males? But I'm I'm saying as a male that actually it is damning the male because it it's not right. But his it's not right, and it doesn't justify what she did. But his disinterested, yes. cold attitude, and and the history of men are inevitably what leads her to her mental state of depression, and then fucking killing her child. He's he. Yeah, I mean, he's just as bad. Like he turns no, into the villain. He is. He is the villain because he is the one. It's like this is another man killing a woman, and she's left here in the forest of all the other women. Yeah. He's gaslighted her into thinking she is also the wrong person as he, well because he's he has never stopped it. He has gas- gaslit her. Yeah, he's he's a bully in a, in a very subtle way. You have to, you just yeah. see it beyond the surface. Like it was too easy on a surface level to just view him as the victim in this fucking thing. Mm. Somehow it's worse, don't you think? It's it's considered worse in society if a mother kills or allows her child to die than if a father does yeah i feel like they i mean it's just society saying that but there's that bond between the actual fact the physical act of childbirth will give you a stronger bond than that makes sense. i think that's bullshit there's plenty of people who are, are closer to their dads than their there is but there isn't at the same time i feel that that's why society says it because you've gone through that physical pain and you've carried it it's because society months. says a woman's worth is based on her being a mother and a, a woman doesn't have worth if she's not a mother. That's what society says. So if you then kill your child, you are literally turning your back on what it means to be a woman. Mm-hmm. Well, you're just... Turning, That's what society says. I mean, says. either way, you're turning your back on what it means to be a parent and a carer. So um, it's if more it's than parents, bad regardless it's, way, but yeah. There's much more expectation on, on uh, women to have kids than there are men to have kids it's almost yeah. like a man could be 60 I think how many famous men in their 60s don't have kids no one talks about it because they could have a kid at any point but mm. women in their 60s who don't have kids it's a talking point mm. yep this is why I wanted to talk about this film this, this, it's look good. how much dis- discourse we've had in, on this film I knew it's this would very, be a good topic f- very good one not a lot of jokes along the way it has to be no, said no <laughs> interesting you can't really be joking about this film <laughs> no <laughs> We can joke now we're on the other end of it. Shall yes. we go to let's hear what people said? Yes. We have two reviews from our, our wonderful Twitter followers. First of all, we have the wonderful Alex from The Contrarians. And all he says is thoughts and prayers. Thank you. I'm, I'm very <laughs> glad you sent us your thoughts and prayers. We needed it to get through that. Yeah, <laughs> It got us through it. Very, very much as well, sending you prayers to get through this. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. He it's knows. probably uh, just as hard for them to get through their recent Beast of No Nation episode because that is a fucking humorless film as oh, well. I man. still need to watch that. I still need to watch it. It's been on my Netflix list for ages. It just yeah. Antichrist is is more of an endurance test, but still, yeah. not, neither of them are easy. And our second, I think it's a bit longer as well. It's two and a half hours, isn't it? Yeah, something like that. And our second review comes from Lucy Buglas, who says, I liked it, but I'll never watch it again, if that makes sense. I thought Antichrist was great, but it's so visceral and horrific, I'm not sure I want to relive it. And it is uh, all of those things, but I feel like I've watched this like maybe five times now. Mm. I could probably do without seeing it again, but I would always return to it because there's so much to pick over. Mm. I, I think this is my second. Mm. I, I, I will never be, I don't think I'll ever watch it again. When I finished watching this... Um, my housemate asked me if we wanted to watch Martyrs not straight after this but at some point in the near future and I was like uh, <laughs> no nah. I'm not really watching that film again that, that's dumb <laughs> you should watch the remake is there a remake of it? yeah there's an American remake it probably is it really just shit. as grim and horrible? <laughs> I don't know who knows but yeah also he said about this film apparently he filmed it in like 2005 but it didn't get released till 2009 
because one of the producers leaked the ending of the film and he got really annoyed with it, so he just put it on a shelf for a while. Yeah, I think I think it was the end of the script maybe that got leaked, or the screenplay. Okay. And I think he changed it because he got annoyed that um, that everyone knew what it, what the ending would be. In the original ending, it was Willem Dafoe who put the boots on the wrong way round, and then yeah. oh, imagine that as a head fuck oh, made her would. think it was her. Yeah, that'd that be, would that would, be a better film. Be good. Well, as it is, it is as it is. Shall we place this? Because we are yes. we are running very long on this episode, and we still got to <laughs> record the Patreon afterwards. <laughs> So we took a little step away there and uh, averaged up the film and it gets a 7 out of 10 and uh, that means it gets positioned in between two films that we've done recently. It is below Killing Off the Sacred Deer and it's above My Son, My Son, What Have Ye Done? So two Willem Dafoe well, films Defoe side film, by side. Yeah. Oh yeah! They sit nice next to each other. Nice. This is definitely it, better than My Son, My Son though. It's definitely better than Killing of a Sacred Deer. So there we go. That was Antichrist. That was Antichrist. What a beautiful discussion that was. Ooh. Yes. So um, before we start wrapping things up over here, we're going to just consult our, our dear patrons to see what they've been uh, watching recently and what they would recommend for our listeners, right? Yes. Yes, we are. Shall I start? Go ahead. Yes. First of all, we've got the wonderful Jamie Russell who appeared last episode. He says... Holy moly, you know what I'm going to be crowing about. Holy Motors is an absolute ride. Go in completely blind and just lose yourself. Beguilingly brilliant from the very beginning. I also love watching One Night in Miami. Beautiful film. Great performance all round with a fantastic dialogue driven script. Possibly most impressive directorial debut since. What do you guys think? Go on. What do you guys think? Oh, he's asking that as a question. Yeah, what do you think? Best directorial debut since... I thought he was going to say Reservoir Dogs. He said Reservoir Dogs. He said that In my opinion, that's what chat. that sentence I mean, sounded like it should be finished off with. I agree, agree with that, with that well. or not. Yes, I, I mean, it's my favourite film. I would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, agree with I, it. I, but also, it's a directorial debut. Like, there's some directors who've made incredible films that have only really, like, made one or two films. Mm, mm. But I would agree with that. It's a yeah. big... Rabbit hole. Actually, I'll, I'll say this. Best directorial debut since Bone Tomahawk. Okay, okay, oh, no. okay, okay. Yes. Okay. See, this is a good call. I'm, 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 I, I, I'll just stick with Reservoir Dogs for the moment because... I'm going to stick with I need Reservoir Dogs. I need to look through films and maybe in about a couple of days I'll look at a film and be like, oh, yeah, shit, that was a yeah. good film. I was just thinking of a director that really stood out to me recently and it would have been Craig S. Zarta, so... Go on then, Adam. Next up here, we have it from Katie and Oti at For Your Reference. They've said we had so much fun watching Seven Psychopaths. Superb writing with a lot of cheeky fun. I'm new to Rockwell in general, and he absolutely stole every scene. The dynamic between Farrell and Rockwell was delicious. Uh, I agree. I love Sam Rockwell. He's brilliant. I don't think... Obviously, you see him in a lot of stuff, and sometimes he's kind of a bit wasted, but every time yeah, he, he gets is, given sometimes. the role, he I do love completely... Him as well. And also, he's he, got such a different range of characters he plays as well. Yeah, I first saw him in Green Mile. That was the first way he came to my yeah, attention. Yeah, he was great in that. He's fucking brilliant in the Way Way Back. Oh, I need to see that still. Mm, very good in that. He runs I always the think water of Moon, park. and I think Sam Rockwell, and then you have got like Moon. Thinking, yeah. Yes, my God, oh, that's where he a truly. One-hander. Yeah, that's where he truly delivered himself to the to yeah. the public eye. And then disappeared swiftly after that. <laughs> he doesn't sell films, does he? That's the thing. I he guess not. Sell yeah, films. he doesn't. He's still not a big name in terms of like, if you say Sam Rockwell to the average guy, he's like, who the fuck's that? Mm, yeah, very true. Here's one that's interesting. I recently ad- added this to my watch list, completely unrelated to Julio suggesting it. So Julio has said, I rewatched The Fisher King, which is just such a bonkers movie. I kind of love it, but have serious issues with it. Got the criterion, so I'm hoping I can dive into the special features soon. Anyway, studly Jeff Bridges, semi-dramatic Robin Williams and videotapes, and the mum from Big being amazing. Mercedes Rule actually got an Oscar for this role. And that makes me happy. So you want to know something about The Fisher King? It's one of Tom York's favourite movies. Oh, really? Yeah, and after Robin Williams died, Tom York doesn't respond to people dying and stuff. The day after Robin Williams died, he tweeted to say, starred in one of the greatest movies of all time. And I was just thinking about it the other day, just why I add it to the watch list. I've never even heard of it before. Yeah, I've never heard of it. No, neither had I, really. Mm. That sounds like a very Tom York film, The Fisher King. <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. know why. <laughs> King of Limbs. Just might figure that. <laughs> I'm going to add it to my watch list now before I forget. 
There we go. Thank there you, go. Patreons. Thank and you. Uh, they'll be recommending stuff for all of you again. Oh, it's next a Terry week. Gillum film. Oh, it Terry could Gillian be a bit wacky. Oh, yeah. It's definitely going to be wacky then. Yeah, it will be wacky yeah. for sure. We're going to carry on the conversation over on Patreon for our Patreons. Remind everyone what we're talking about, Paul. We're talking about our favourite films that explore what it is like to be a female, linking directly yeah. to our Antichrist episode. Probably not yes. as horrific as our Antichrist episode but oh, no, anyway <laughs> no so we'll be doing that for all of you patreons directly after this but before we say goodbye to everyone else young yes. adam what are we going to be watching next week okay this is it i've had two films in my head and um, one film i keep wanting to do but i keep finding every it's like kind of my, it feels like it's now my backup film if i can't think of anything but there's always something i look at and go we're doing that we're doing that I am changing lanes quickly from the Antichrist. Okay, we're okay. going. We're swiping four lanes across the motorway here, and now we're just going to cruise control. Um, this film it's good, is good metaphor. It's a superhero film. Oh, oh shit! What are you thinking, man? Oh, you but better be doing something good here. It is Lego Batman. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I haven't seen it. I want to. I want to see how you feel like this is done. This is interesting. Yeah, I thought, yes. oh, yeah. Decent. I feel I'm we can have a lot of fun with this film. Yeah. Because the film, in my opinion, is a lot of fun. I'm well, up no for spoilers that. Spoilers for how you feel. I haven't seen it. It's on Amazon Prime if anyone wants to watch it before we watch it next week. So it's fairly easy for everyone to get around to it. Lego watching. Batman. Look and at that. We'll see if Paul preaches a sermon about Batman over it. Oh, maybe I will. I hope so. I'm going to try and antagonise you. Is it the first time you've done a Batman film? <laughs> It is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> the first Batman what a way. film. What a way. And it's been suggested by you, Adam. Yes. You lucky. I just, you just saved it yourself. Thought, this is fun. This is going to be... Yeah. Well, okay. Let's see how it rolls out. Okay. I'm not going to say anything, but I, I, I will tell you this much. I enjoyed the Lego movie, so okay. I don't see it annoying me. I'm going in completely cold. I don't know anything about it. I enjoyed the Lego movie. I enjoyed Batman, so it should be an okay bit of fun. Yeah, the two bricks should combine. Yes, and connect and go dlingling like yeah. Tetris. <laughs> dlingling. Yes. We no were actually talking about Lego. Lego. Wow. All right, let's go Lego over to the Patreon channel. <laughs> See you over there. See you at the Bye. Patreon. Bye. Bye.